If you'll stand just one more minute, I'm reading from Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Moses is speaking to the Israelites as they face the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind them and the Red Sea in front of them. And here we find, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. I'm preaching for a few minutes tonight from fear to faith. This is what I believe the Lord has said that we need in order to possess the land from fear to faith. You may be seated. We are people of faith. We're saved by faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. As human beings, we would much prefer to walk by sight. But the Bible tells us we can't walk by sight. We must walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. That's so important, it's stated no less than four different books of Scripture. From the prophet Habakkuk to the book of Romans to Galatians to Hebrews. The just, the righteous, the saints shall live by faith. We're saved by faith. We're blessed by faith. We are sustained by faith. We live by faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. If we live in fear, it's very difficult to live in faith. If fear predominates, we can't walk by faith. As I know, we all have fears, we all have doubts, but you can't let your doubts win. You can't let your fears win. As I remember Bishop Golder years ago, right here in Indianapolis said, we all have our doubts, but here's the problem or here's the solution. Don't believe your doubts and don't doubt your beliefs. When it's all said and done, face the fear in the face. Face the doubt in the face and say, I refuse to live in doubt. I refuse to live in fear. I choose to move forward by faith. And so I'm preaching tonight all the wonderful promises that we've talked about in this conference. And hasn't the Lord spoken in amazing ways each night and each day from Brother Huntley to Brother Hunley to Brother Collins? We've gotten clear direction. There's no doubt about where we stand in our doctrine. There is no doubt if you've attended this conference, there is no doubt what we teach about holiness. If there is no doubt that we believe in the miraculous, there's no doubt we believe in church planting and church growth but in order to see all those promises and commitments come to pass we must move from fear to faith in the text Israel had received a miraculous deliverance they were slaves but God through many miracles including ten plagues delivered them from slavery in Egypt now they were headed to the promised land they were free but there was one last obstacle in their way the uncrossable Red Sea and in order to receive their permanent victory in order to receive permanent freedom they had to cross the Red Sea there was a great opportunity. It was literally the opportunity of a lifetime. But with opportunity is a challenge. And with the challenge, there's always a risk. And with risk, there's always fear. I'm not saying we never have fear. If you're a normal human being, if you're a man or woman of God, at times you will have fear. But here is the key. You've got to move from fear to faith. If you read Exodus 14 from the beginning, verses 1 through 12 preceding my text, you'll find that God told Moses exactly what was going to happen. All of the problems that we face are, are known in advance to God. God already has a plan to bring us through. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. God already knows what he's going to do. God already knows the miracle that's going to take place. And so God gave Moses the instructions ahead of time. 
They came to the Red Sea and they faced the crisis of their life because in front of them was the uncrossable sea, but behind them was the Egyptian army that it was coming quickly and they would either be killed or captured and brought back into slavery. They couldn't go any direction. They couldn't go forward, they couldn't go backward, and they couldn't stay where they were. It seemed like an impossible situation. And if you read the, the scripture, they responded with great fear. Such fear, they began to complain and said it would be better for us to have remained in slavery in Egypt than to be in this situation we face right now. And sometimes that's the way we feel. God, you called us. It had been better for us to never move. It would have been better for us never to start the church. It would have been better for us to never witness. It would be better that we'd never done what you we thought we want you wanted us to do we've been better off and that was their fear speaking but god gave the plan of action and moses began to speak if you look at the text for just a few minutes verse 13 14 and the next verse 15 you'll see seven elements of god's plan of action i'll just take a few moments to share them first of all don't be afraid there is fear but what we must do is confront and overcome our fear. Do not live in fear. Don't be afraid. Number two, stand still. Don't depend on your own ability. Don't depend on your own wisdom. Don't try to take matters into your own hands. I believe, Brother Mooney, in training and education, so do you. But we cannot depend upon degrees and education to do the will of God. I thank God for incredible ability, such as we've seen with our musicians and singers. It's simply amazing. But we cannot have apostolic revival by depending depending on eloquence of speech or wonderful talent in a human level. Somehow we're tempted to face those fears with our own education or our own talent or our own resources or our own money. money. But God says, wait a minute, stand still, slow down, listen to what God has in mind because what we do is only in the natural, but what God will do is in the supernatural. Stand still. There is a time to act, but first you better hear from God. First you better pray. First you better get God's timing and God's direction. Number three, see the salvation of the Lord. Look to the Lord for the answer. Look to the Lord for the victory. God wants us to find impossible situations so that we could never get glory. We look to the Lord and see the salvation of the Lord. And when the Lord comes for through, nobody can get the glory. Nobody could say, well, it was General Superintendent Bernard that did it. Nobody could say it was General Secretary Graham who did it. Everybody will look in amazement and say these people had their role, but it was God who gave us the victory. Victory. It was God who gave us the revival. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Number four, God will use the situation to give you a permanent victory. I love the archaic King James in this particular instance. The Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. I don't norm normally talk that way, but that is the perfect way to describe this enemy that's getting ready to take you back in bondage, this enemy that's getting ready to kill you, this enemy that you're quaking in fear. They're a mighty professional army with the latest weaponry, and you're just some peasants and shepherds. But I want to tell you, God says, that enemy that you see today, you will see again no more forever. I will give you a permanent victory. You will never go back to slavery again. You will never go back to Egypt again. Now they faced trials in the wilderness. And even when they got to the promised land, they had to fight to possess it. But one thing about it, they never went back to Egypt. They never went back to slavery. They never had to fight Pharaoh. They never had to fight the Egyptian army. We can have a permanent victory. Now we're gonna have trials till the Lord comes. We're gonna have a fight the rest of our lives. 
but you can achieve a significant victory. And through great trial, and through great tribulation, or great opportunity and risk, you can win a permanent victory. That's what happened when you were born again. It changed your life forever. That's what happened when you accepted your call to preach. It changed your life forever. That's what happened, home missionary. Maybe it was year two or year three or year five, but you broke through that barrier and you've never looked back since. You've got new challenges and new problems, but you're never going back. You're never facing those old battles because you've broken to the next level. I'm promising and prophesying tonight, somebody is going to receive a permanent victory. You will break through to the next level and you will never be the same. You will never go back again. A permanent victory, a decisive victory. I use this, I preached on uh, that message. I'll just throw this in. I used it earlier this year. Some of you have heard it. But remember the amazing story in the people of Israel of the young man that faced the giant and killed him. You know that story well, I'm sure. You can tell me that story. Even your Sunday school kids can tell the story. Of course you know that story of the story of Abishai killing Ishbi Benab. You're aware of that story, aren't you? Right? Or maybe it's Jonathan, the son of Shimei, that you're thinking about. Or maybe it's Elhanan that you're thinking about. Am I, am I, am I hitting the right? You, you recognize it? For some reason, even though it's in the Bible, it's in 2 Samuel 21, there are four stories of Israelites killing giants, but we don't know those stories. Because the first story was a young man named David killed Goliath. That had never been done before in the history of Israel. It was impossible. The whole nation from the king on down was quaking in fear. But once a teenage boy anointed by God killed the giant, that changed the destiny of Israel. That changed the thinking of Israel. That changed the paradigm of Israel. After then, it seems like every young warrior said, I think I could kill me a giant. I think I could kill that giant over there. Abishai said, I think I could kill a beast be then uh, Jonathan, son of Shimei, said, I think I could kill me a giant. It was a decisive victory. This week, God wants to give some decisive victories to the United Pentecostal Church International. It's already happened. That was North American Youth Congress. We proved it could be done. That was She's for Christ. We proved it could be done. That was I Am Global. It proved it could be done and will never be the same again. We're never going back. We're moving forward. It's a new territory. We're moving from fear to faith. Some evangelist, some missionary, some pastor is going to win a decisive victory. And when everybody hears that, they're going to say, not that he was a superhero. They're going to say, if he could do that, I could do that. If that could happen, in Ohio, that can happen in Missouri. A decisive victory, a permanent victory. We're moving from fear to faith. Continue, the sixth point, hold your peace. So when it comes time to act, or number five, I'm sorry, it's going into verse 14, God will fight for you. There is the definite promise. If you'll follow this plan of waiting for the salvation of the Lord and believing God for a decisive, permanent victory, then you do have the promise. God will show up. God will fight for you. You will start seeing some things in your situation beginning to change. You will see some initial signs of your future victory because God shows up and God begins to work. God will fight for you. And then, number six, hold your peace. So as you approach the battle, you've got to be calm. It doesn't mean be inactive. It means be calm. Be ready. Don't get all worked up in your own human emotion. 
We face real enemies, but our real enemies are not other people, although it seems that way. They're not our brothers and sisters in the church, although that seems that way. It's not our neighboring pastor, although it seems that way. Don't get caught up in fighting your neighboring pastor or your saints or your backsliders or your visitors. They are not really your enemy. The devil is your enemy. Don't fight people, fight the enemy of their soul. People can be used as a tool of the enemy, but be calm. Just, just slow down and see what's really going on in the realm of spirit. Don't respond with human emotion. Respond by the word of God and the spirit of God. Hold your peace. Think clearly. Trust in the Lord. And then verse 15. And verse 15 switches to God's direct command. Verses 13 and 14, Moses spoke to the people based on what God had already said. But after the people listened and they were ready to receive, they went through steps one through six, so to speak. Then verse 15, God said, okay, now, Moses, stretch out that rod. Now, Moses, go forward. There is a time to act. And I believe right here in this conference, we're going through steps one through six. Right here in this conference, don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Trust a permanent victory. God's going to fight for you if you'll hold your peace. But that's not all. We've got to march out of this arena into the streets of our city and back into our home. And we've got to go forward in Jesus' name. We must move from fear to faith. At the end, we must act in faith. Now, I want to take a few minutes. I want to slow down a few minutes here. What about the things that are unknown? What about the things that are impossible? I'm just going to give you a few scripture to, because it's found in the Word of God. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? When you face that impossible situation, go back to what God says. He's, I'm, I'm the God of all flesh. Of seven billion people on planet Earth, I'm the God of all of them. If you're the only one of seven billion people that's ever faced that problem, if you're only the only one of 10,000 ministers in North America that's faced that problem, so what? I'm the Lord God of everybody. Is anything too hard for me? Obviously not. The angel Gabriel appealed appeared to a young woman, a virgin named Mary, and said, you're going to have a child. She said, well, how can that be? I'm a virgin. It's impossible. And the angel said, Luke 1, with God, nothing is impossible. Jesus was speaking to his disciples and talked about how difficult it is for rich people to go to heaven. The disciples recalled in shock because according to their thinking, if you really were going to be blessed by God, you would be rich. And if you're rich, it's obvious you were blessed by God. Everybody wants to be rich. The disciples are, are saying, wait a minute, God. We all want to be rich. What do you mean rich people can't go to heaven? Well, that's what we want to be. And that's highly relevant to us because we don't think we're rich. But by the standards of human history and the rest of the world, we're rich. If you have a car, multiple cars, you're rich. If you have electronic appliances and gadgetry, you're rich. If you can eat whatever you want, when you want, and your main concern is gaining weight, you're rich. If you can go to a buffet or a salad bar or a restaurant and choose from a hundred different items, you're rich. And so the disciples were, Lord, what do you mean? And he said in Mark 10, 27, well, with God, all things are possible. Even people like us actually can be saved because with God, all things are possible. Notice these statements of faith. We can have revival in North America. I 100% agree with Brother Huntley. I was raised on the mission field. I can tell you every story you could imagine from personal observation. But I also can tell you story for story. I can tell you of watching demons being cast out in Korea. I can also tell you of demons being cast out in Austin, Texas. I can tell you of the dead being raised. But I can also tell you of the dead being raised in Austin, Texas. Whatever story you have, I can tell you it's not only happening overseas. It's happening 
happening right here in the U.S. and Canada. It may seem difficult. It may seem impossible. But remember, God, with God, nothing is impossible. With God, all things are possible. In our culture, we can face the challenges of secular North American culture, and we can still see the miracle working power of God. We've got to move from fear to faith. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power. We have the power of God and of love. Maybe that's part of our problem because it's not just about power. It's about loving people. If you don't have a soul winning church, you, why would God ex give a lot of power? There's got to be power, but there's got to be love. And God has given us that and a sound mind. That's why it's okay to plan. God gives you a mind to plan. In other words, God's giving you whatever it takes to do what he's called you to do. God's commands are God's enablings. Whatever God tells you to do, he gives you the power, the love, and the sound mind to do what he commands. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. That's true in North American culture. That's true no matter what demonic forces are in our culture. Verse 18 goes on to say, because perfect love casts out fear. I'm persuaded that fear is real, but I'm also persuaded if we can love God with all of our heart, and if we can love souls with all of our heart, then that love is going to cast out fear, we'll move from fear to faith, and nothing shall be impossible to us. Now, just for a few minutes, I want to talk about overcoming fear. I want to mention seven concerns briefly, and I want you to listen because I feel I'd love to just preach an evangelistic message and be done with it, but I feel like I'm supposed to speak to the church, and I have to give insight and direction in the, the way God, I feel, has put it on my heart. So I want to talk about some concerns, and I could be misunderstood. Let me just say very clearly, the concerns I'm going to mention are legitimate it is legitimate to be concerned about these things, but we cannot live in fear of these things. We cannot act in fear because of these things. We have to recognize the concerns and the problems, but consciously decide, I will not act because of fear. I will move from fear to faith. Number one is the fear of compromise. We are a conservative, even strict holiness organization. So the way to rouse, rise, get, get us roused up in our human thinking is to suggest compromise. If you don't like something, if you can convince people it's compromise, then you can kill it. That's how we operate in our movement. Now, I, you may not like what I'm gonna say, but just hear me out. I've written our bo the books on our doctrine. I think I've shown I believe in our doctrine as much as anybody. I've actually faced it when, when I was in the minority and standing up for what we believe. I can tell you story after story, but I don't want to belabor the point. But I'm saying you cannot have a revival church if you're just consumed by fear of compromise. Notice the concern is legitimate. I don't want us to compromise the oneness of God, the new birth, tongues as initial sign, the life of holiness, modesty of dress, gender distinction, ladies having long hair. You just go down the list. I do not want us to compromise one iota, but I can't do, operate my ministry based primarily of fear that we're going to fall into compromise. You can't have revival when you're living in fear. Now you say, what are you talking about? Well, when I was pastoring, so this is a number of years ago, so you know, any personal references are so old it doesn't matter. But I had a guy that moved from another part of our country from a very strict holiness church. And he came to our church, he loved it, but, but after a few months he said, Pastor, I just don't understand how can you have all these people coming and some of them, they've received the Holy Ghost, well, they, they won't get baptized in Jesus' name. How can you allow that? 
And there's some of them, they, they receive the Holy Ghost, but they're, they're still wearing jewelry, they're still wearing makeup. How can, how can you put up with that? Why don't you deal with that? I said, you know, we're trying to win them. Some people understand everything immediately, but some, it takes time. And I said, I, when they, if they're coming on Sunday morning, that's not the core church. But I'm not going to run them off as long as they're coming because I have an unfair advantage. I've got the Word of God. I've got the power of the Holy Spirit. If they'll keep coming, I'm going to win them. That's how I look at it. Now, I said, if you look at our leaders and, and so on, you know what we believe and you know what I teach. You've heard me teach. So well, I'm still struggling with that because in our church back home, we wouldn't let people come like that. I said, okay, how many were in your church at home? He said, well, about 25. I said, let's assume all 25 were ready for the rapture. At that time, we had about 500 in our church. I said, okay, we've got about 500 coming. I'm not saying they're all ready to meet God. I'm not saying they're all saved. Let's say only half of them are saved, only 250. Which approach is winning more souls for the kingdom of God? You see, you can't live in fear. Now, I'll give you another example. So this was a long time ago. There was some kind of social media forum, an apostolic forum of some kind. I wasn't part of it, but, but one of my friends said, hey, Brother Bernard, they're talking about you. Would you care to give an answer? I said, so they said what it was. So I said, well, look, I'll tell, give you the answer. You can do what you want. And so somebody wrote, oh, I thought Brother Bernard was such a great holiness preacher. But I went to his church. I was so disappointed to see so many unholy people. So my friends, well, how would you like to respond to that? I said, well, I assume he came on Sunday morning. If he came on Sunday morning, he probably saw 50 visitors that were, would not understand our way of dress. And he probably saw 50 converts of the last six months baptized or receiving the Holy Ghost that would be in process. So I agree. He probably saw 100 people in that service that would not follow our teachings of holiness. But if he looked at our choir, our musicians, our praise singers, our Sunday school teachers, our children's ministry workers, our youth workers, our hostesses, our ushers, our church board, our ministerial staff, he would find not only do they have the new birth, they followed written guidelines that they agreed to of dress, of no drinking, no smoking, a modest lifestyle, ladies having long hair, men cutting their hair short, ladies not wearing pants, men's not wearing dresses. I'm not just picking on one. I'm going to go down the line the whole way. And if you've ever been to Austin, Texas, you know you can't take anything for granted. you got to spell it out. Because, yes, we had men coming to church in dresses. That happened. So I was perfectly clear. So I said, I don't apologize for that. Because that's how you grow a church. You set a clear standard, but you've got to be inclusive of souls. When you're talking about visitors, when you're talking about converts, when you're talking about working with real people in a lost world, you cannot live in fear that they're going to destroy you. You've got to have faith that you are going to overwhelm them with the Word of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and the example of the saints. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm concerned that the UPCI not compromise. I'm concerned about that. What do I do? I study. I preach. I teach. I write. If you're concerned, I suggest you study and get it deeply so it's not just something you're saying because you have a label, but it's something you understand. You know backwards and forwards. You preach it. You teach it. You affirm it. And you trust the next generation. Let me hasten on. Second fear is fear of secular culture. I agree it's a legitimate concern. We're faced with an ungodly society with all kinds of teachings of sexual immorality, same-sex marriage, transgender, paganism, new age movement. You could go on and on and on. That's a legitimate concern. But we cannot, 
withdraw in isolation because of fear. We have to actually believe greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So what am I going to do? Again, I'm going to study to know what I believe in relation to these false teachings. I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach. I'm going to commit my way to God. I'm not going to tremble in fear. Yes, I'm concerned about the influence on my kids and now my grandkids, but I've got to commit them to God. I can't live in fear. I've got to pray over them. I've got to preach and teach to them. I've got to live it. Those lost people, I can't isolate myself from them. I cannot ban them from coming to church, but I need to reach out to them. I need to love them. I need to win lost souls because nothing is impossible with God. Yes, we've seen people from a lesbian lifestyle, a homosexual lifestyle, a transgender lifestyle, addicted to cocaine. You go and you name it. People that tried to commit suicide. People who are in mental hospitals. People with medical diagnosis of illness, physical and mental. I could go all night and tell you of testimonies of seeing people come out of those lifestyles and those addictions. Being baptized in Jesus' name. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Being saints in the church. Singing in the choir. Teaching Sunday school. You can't isolate yourself in fear. You got to move from fear to faith. Number three, fear of change. Because we are concerned over compromise. When no, nobody likes change, all right? So when somebody starts changing, we get afraid. Especially because people that want to change our identity, they start with little changes that are okay. And they get you lulled to sleep with change and then they start crossing the line. And we've all seen that happen so much that anytime somebody changes one thing, we're jumping to the conclusions. I remember one time our associate pastor, now this is when we we're more strict than we we're now. Austin is such a laid back culture, its official city motto is keep Austin weird. And so the people dress accordingly. <laughs> Meaning people don't even know that we have holding the standards that everybody dresses weird. They don't even know that we're dressing weird. They don't even know that all the ladies are wearing dresses. It doesn't dawn on them because you never know what, who will wear what. And so it takes them a while. Oh, all the ladies here wear, wear dresses. It, it, they can't figure it out because everybody dresses their own way. And so one time our assistant pastor was working, doing some manual labor at church, and he ran out of time. He was going to go home and change and come back, but he couldn't. So he actually stayed in church without a tie. And one of our faithful saints came up who had gone through a church split in another church. The church went, quote, unquote, in our lingo, charismatic. So she'd been there and she'd seen it. She saw the signs. So she comes up and say, are we going charismatic? Assistant pastor's not wearing a tie. Are we going charismatic? Is that the first step? So I understand that's a legitimate concern. But all change is not compromise. How do you know the difference? We've got to focus on the Bible rather than tradition, even our own Pentecostal tradition. Now look, I'm 62 years old. I resonate to I surrender all. I resonate to it's all in him. I resonate to those kinds of songs. But guess what? You like the kind of songs and the kind of preaching when you came into the church or when you grew up in the church, when you were a teenager, the prevailing styles are your favorite. So you're not completely comfortable with anything else. But you cannot say all change is compromise just because it's not your personal preference. I hope your church will reach out to the older people like me so that we feel comfortable. But I also hope your church reaches out to people who didn't grow up in Pentecost, to people who are teenagers and 20-somethings that really had no clue what bringing in the sheaves mean. They don't even know what sheaves are. They don't understand Jesus on the main line. They're really worried about what main line means. They're not aware of the royal telephone but somehow we've got to change without compromising our identity I'm being candid so some 20 something show up with casual dress little facial hair which I'm 100% against that 
on women, but... Uh, <laughs> But they're think, you know, they hear a great sermon on gender distinction. They think they're doing what the pastor said. They don't know that that's not what we were probably talking about. Now, I know that's a sensitive point, and I'm not trying to change your conviction or your church or what your pastor teaches. I'm just saying you can't live in fear of something that is not a scriptural thing but a cultural thing or a tradition thing we've got to emphasize the Bible as the absolute we methods are secondary they can change principles don't change here's what I found helped me I was raised as a missionary did you know in Korea they had different styles of dress they had different styles of food they had different styles of music. They had different styles of dancing. When they, the, the spirit moved and they danced, they didn't dance like Americans. They danced like Koreans. They, they had different customs. And, and my parents said, we're not trying to make you Americans. We're trying to make you Christians. We're not trying to get you to worship like Americans. We're trying to get you to worship like the Bible, like the book of Psalms. Now, if you're my age, you are a missionary in this culture. So it's not just what song makes me feel good or what style of dress communicates to me authority or respect or whatever. I have to be wise enough to say what is the language that these unsaved teenagers and 20-somethings speak. Because most of our converts are going to be kids and teenagers and young adults. Right? So if we're missionaries to them, we have to understand what makes what they think about and how can we relate in a term without compromising our identity? Please understand. If you're not comfortable with some things I'm saying, my main point is this. We can't live in fear. We have to move forward in faith. You can be as strict as you feel like God has called you to be, but it has to be in faith. You have to appeal. And I would say, trust our young ministers. I'm not saying carte blanche, but I'm saying, like Ronald Reagan said about the Russians, trust but verify. If I get Brother Josh Carson to preach, I trust him absolutely. But I'm not going to turn off my brain if he starts teaching false doctrine. I'll go talk to him. Don't worry. But I start from a position I trust him. His text may not be my text. His illustration may not be my illustration. But I'm going to listen with the attitude he's probably right. And if it sounds a little strange, I'm, gonna, I'm probably the one that didn't get it. I'm probably the one that misunderstood the current terminology. But I will go home and double check and make sure. <laughs> Trust the next generation. Fear of church growth. That sounds strange. Everybody wants to grow. But there's a fear. I understand the fear. We, when we built our first building in two years, we went from 125 to 250. That's exciting. But when half your people are new... That can be scary. How do you disciple them? And then it's great to plant a new church, but what if that new church takes all the people from our church? I remember one district far away and long ago, we we're trying to teach on church growth, and the superintendent said, I believe what you're saying, but you need to meet my district board. I said, Really? He said, Yeah, you need to meet my district board and ask them why we can't have new churches. So I said, Okay. I said, Why, why can't we plant new churches? One man spoke up and said, our churches are all so small. If we let another church come in, they could wipe us out. So we don't need another church. To me, if all the churches are small, that means you need more churches. Another guy spoke up and said, you don't understand. Pentecost is so foreign in our area. It'll take us generations before people will accept Pentecost. Wait a minute. You cannot live in fear of bad ethics and try to block churches and have turf protection what you got to do is teach ministerial ethics you got to enforce ministerial ethics but you've got to release and let go i know what it's like to be afraid to release someone in ministry because i need them for myself there was a wake up i used to think if we only got to 100 we could handle everything and then when we got to 100 i thought well if we could only get to 200 we could have everything and, you know, I worked really hard, build the youth program, build the children's program, build the music program. My wife and I were in charge of every program, but gradually we trained leaders and we had leaders in place. So I thought if I could get all these leaders in place, then I'll have a good team, we'll have a good church. But you know what I found? About the time I got 10 leaders in place, one backslid. 
Another got a bad attitude. Another did exactly the opposite of what I said. I had to replace them. So I, I realized I would never have a perfect team. It was always going to be a work in progress, which I realized was a good thing because that's job security for the senior pastor. <laughs> so then I realized if God calls one of my best leaders to plan a daughter work, that doesn't mess up my perfect team. If it's the right time and if it's the will of God, I'm better off letting that person go. You know why? Because God has another person that's going to rise up and take their place. It's the same reason I give to global missions. You could say, well, we can't give to global missions. We have to save money for our new building. You know what I learned? Give to global missions and God will help you grow a new building. When we moved from our last building to the new one, we sold the old property for $3 million. That was every dollar we had invested in that property. God gave it back to us as a down payment on our new building. But at the same time, I calculate, Brother Howell, in that same period of time, we gave $3 million to world missions. You can have your cake and eat it too in the kingdom of God. You can give it away and grow it back. You can give to missions. You can give leaders to neighboring churches. You can plant churches and you can grow it back. Don't live in fear of church growth. God has a plan to grow your church and grow other churches too. Fear of loss. I covered that. It's the same thing. Fear of church growth. Fear of loss. Fear of fellowship. Some people are afraid of fellowship. They call it they're afraid of the organization. Organization is not perfect. But, you know, start with trust instead of suspicion. Not every decision I make is right. But I hope people at least when they hear, I can't believe Brother Bernard did that. I can't believe headquarters did that. Well, maybe you shouldn't believe it then. Maybe you should call me. I do have a cell phone. I do have an email and I have a secretary uh, executive assistant. You can actually get a hold of me. If you have a question, you can call brother Graham. If you're, if you're, you know, if you don't, you, you don't want to bring it to the level of the general superintendent, then talk to brother Graham or talk to my assistant, Rhonda Morley, talk to somebody. But if you have a legitimate question, you deserve a legitimate answer, but don't go speculating or believing the worst. Start don't, don't live in fear of your own organization. Just because your organization might make some mistakes doesn't mean you can live in fear. Figure out what those mistakes are. Talk to the right people. Fix them. Vote on them. Do whatever you have to do. But at the end of the day, there needs to be servant leadership, mutual accountability, communication, participation. Invest in your organization. Help it. Develop a healthy culture. If you're worried about your district having a dysfunctional culture, well, you create a healthy culture. I remember when I was a whole missionary, and I and another pastor were in that same section. We were both from outside the section. We both had missions field experience. And there were several churches pushing the liberal edge. In fact, they fell off the liberal edge later. And then their leadership was very reactionary, a very harsh and and, and just trying to control it. So you had these two polarizations. And so my friend said, you know what? I'm not coming back to another event. I'm not bringing my youth to, to the youth event because this is a dysfunctional section. I said, hey, if you and I both come, we bring all of our young people, we bring all of our church, we will outnumber the others, we'll change the culture of the section. We'll have revival in the youth service. A couple years, I was elected presbyter. We were able to change the culture. The same two of us. There were no daughter works. We we're going to start daughter works. So in seven years, we grew from 30 churches and no daughter works to 53 churches and daughter works. I'm saying, if you don't like your section or your district or whatever's going on, why don't you start investing? Why don't you start changing the culture? Why don't you be the peer that exerts the pressure? Don't live in fear. And then finally... Fear of failure. We're all afraid to step out by faith and do something we've never done before. I know that feeling very regularly. I started a church, started 16 daughter works, started a new district, started a new seminary, started a new college. Every step of the way, there are people that said it can't be done, and there are people that said we don't want you to do it. It's scary, and it costs money, and, and the stakes are higher. You've got to move from fear to faith. 
I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I want to give you some examples. Los Angeles, California. Raul Orozco, our Spanish Evangelism Ministries Director, started church in 1986. He now has a church of approximately 500 people. That's an amazing story. But he's also started 28 works out of his church. Those works have a total of 7,300 people. They can only get together once a year in one auditorium. Who says you cannot have revival in Los Angeles? Who says you can't plant daughter works without destroying your mother work? No, you can do it in Jesus' name. I hope you're showing these pictures. Dallas, Fort Worth, Brent Jones, North Richland Hills, Texas, started a work in 2001. I'm sorry I don't have his picture, but he did a great work. But several years ago, he felt a burden. Many of his people were coming. He was on the north side of Dallas-Fort Worth. People were coming from the south side. And there had also been another work years ago that left us and totally abandoned our identity. And there were still people that needed something. And so two years ago, this is shocking. I've never done this except with Spanish. I've never done it with English people because I was too scared. He sent 55 people and $100,000 from his church in 2017 to start a new church. And Chris Copeland in Joshua, Texas now has 200 people two years later. When I became general superintendent, the largest church and the largest city in the U.S. and Canada that had no church at all of the UPCI was Quebec City. Several years ago, Melissa Frost, yes, a woman in ministry, started the first United Pentecostal Church in Quebec City, Quebec, Canada. A lot of people, I'm sure, said it couldn't be done. The largest city in the U.S. that had no UPCI church when I became general superintendent was Newark, New Jersey. The North Central Jersey district has started to move. They're a small district, but in the last five years, they planted eight works. This year, I preached the fifth anniversary and church dedication for Pastor Warren White in Newark, New Jersey. That weekend, I preached in the suburb of Irving, Irvington, Dimitri Williams, another pastor. I don't have the picture, but he also has a new building. Neville Clark, the brother of our superintendent of Cayman Islands, was a Trinitarian Pentecostal preacher. He was baptized in Jesus' name, baptized his whole congregation. I preached for him. He just bought property to expand his building. Three churches right there in Newark, New Jersey. I'm saying it can be done. It is being done. Thibodeau, Louisiana. It's close to my heart because my grandfather was from there. I never knew him at Thibodeau. You think of Louisiana, you think Bible Belt. South Louisiana is not the Bible Belt. It's French Catholic Cajun. Shorthand version, it's the Mardi Gras culture. It's pagan. My grandfather, his first language was French. And when he married a Protestant woman, they kicked him out of the family. And so he traveled to Baton Rouge, and that's where my family heard of Pentecost. He became a preacher with the Assemblies of the Lord, the church, uh, the uh, Pentecost Assemblies of Jesus Christ, predecessor at UPC, and he was a French evangelist in South Louisiana. So several years ago, I preached for Josh Melanson. Yes, it's Melanson in Thibodeau, Louisiana. And the Bernards are famous in Thibodeau. They're all my relatives there. I don't know any of them because they're all Catholic, and they kicked us out. But... If you go to Thibodeau, and you, if, you know, if you meet a Bernard, it's one of my cousins. He took over a solid, strong apostolic church from his father six years ago. In six years, they've had 500 converts. Now, that sounds exciting un until you think these are non-Christians, never been discipled, you now have a good church of several hundred, but you add 500 new converts. And so I've been preaching for him every year, and I've been advising him. He's, he wants my advice. He wants UPC identity, but he says, you know, Brother Bernard, I've got all these people, and I'm sure our, our neighboring pastors are thinking, you know, he's just going 
worldly, you know, all these people with all these things. And I said, what you got to do is focus on the Bible, not tradition. You just teach Bible. Whatever's in the Bible, you hold them to it. If it's not the Bible, you, 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 you can't, just don't kind of leave, leave that aside. And I said, you need to start with your leadership team. Make sure they start lining up with the Bible. But you got to use people. You can't just not use them, but find ways and maybe non-traditional ways that are not leadership, that don't dilute your message. But you got to start getting them involved. And I said, he, and he told, to, uh, and, and maybe he's listening tonight, so I, I hope he doesn't mind me being candid because we're we both very candid with each other. I said, you know, I understand why people might be worried or af afraid, but I said, why don't you start taking your people to camp and to ladies' conference and all that because expose them to what's going on. Last time I preached for him, he said, I, I took your advice. He said, it's been the, a wonderful thing. It's been an exciting thing. I talked to his district superintendent, Brother Cox. He affirms that. They took 80 women to this year's ladies' conference, and 10 received the Holy Ghost. They took 50 men to men's conference. Three received the Holy Ghost. They had to teach them what to expect as far as dress and appropriateness. But you see, what I'm saying is you could live in fear of church growth and revival and hold down the revival that God has given. But I want to reach out to situations like that and say, if I can help you find a way to add 500 to your church and disciple the majority of them and have a solid apostolic church, I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to test it out. I'm willing to try it because I want to act in faith. I preached in Gramercy. What's that? St. James Parish? There has never been an apostolic church, much less UPCI church, of any kind in the total history of St. James Parish. We have the first and only one. That's a foreign mission field. That's difficult to disciple people, but you can't say, forget about those people. They won't make good apostolics with modesty of dress in the first six months, so we just can't have a church. No, we've got to find a way to be true to our identity, but move from fear to faith. Georgetown, this is personal, I hope you don't mind. Georgetown, Texas, northern suburb of Austin. It's Metro Austin. Some years ago we sent Donnie and Cassie Hussage to take a little small church in a rented building. They've done so, they've done a great work. They brought building and property on the north outskirts of town, but they, and they're building a new building even as we speak. But then they realized that leaves the center of Georgetown really unreached. So he recruited a friend to come and start a daughter work in his own city. He started a home missions work, Andy Gossett. He talked to Pastor Shaw, the pastor of the mother church. He said, I need a good assistant who can help me. Could you release someone? And so Rodney Shaw sends one of his own leaders named Jonathan Bernard. That's why it's personal. He's assistant to the pastor. His wife is the music director. And lo and behold, I can't believe this. Uh, my, my son Daniel is an expert drummer. My son Jonathan, expert bass player. But Jonathan is the keyboardist for this church. What I'm saying is we can work together. We don't have to work in opposition. We don't have to fight each other. Move from fear to faith. I'm coming to a close. Here's what I'm saying. Christian life and ministry give us the greatest opportunity of our lives. With opportunity comes challenge. With challenge comes risk. With risk comes fear. We must face the challenge and take the risk. In other words, we need to walk by faith. Not a blind faith, but a reasonable faith. But at the end of the day, it's faith. Acknowledge your fear and face it. Then choose to act in faith. Step out of your comfort zone to do the will of God. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two, have faith in God. It sounds simplistic. It's not. It's simple but profound. At the end of the day, have faith faith in God. God has already spoken to some people this week. God is speaking tonight. God will speak tomorrow night. When you hear the still, small voice of God, you've got to move from fear to faith. You've got to have faith in God. Have faith in God. Move from fear to faith, and you will see the incredible. 
Three weeks ago, I preached for Pastor Shaw. He shared with me a testimony. A man had been a Buddhist for 23 years. Six months ago, he was meditating and started getting into demonic forces that disturbed him. But as he was sleeping, God gave him a vision because evidently God saw a hungry heart or a dream. And in that dream, a woman in white apparel, apparently an angel, said, your answer is in Jesus. You need to find Jesus. He went to a charismatic church to find Jesus. It's a church I know well. They believe in the Spirit, but they don't have much opportunity. So what they do, and it, actually they told me, they tell people, if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, go down to New Life. They know how to pray people through to the Holy Ghost. Then you can come back to our church. He went there for six months, and he said, but I'm still not finding what I need. Somebody told him about Pentecostals, so he went to the evil internet, and he went on evil YouTube, and he saw a Pentecostal preacher, and so he Googled Pentecostal Church Austin. He found new life. He said when he walked in the doors, he felt, this is what I've been looking for. That night, he was baptized in Jesus' name, came up out of the water speaking in tongues. A Buddhist for 23 years. The next week, I preached in Syracuse, New York. A Muslim immigrant was baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost. Don't live in fear. Yes, the Muslims are here. The Buddhists are here. The atheists are here. The carnal Christians are here. The charismatics are here. The compromising Pentecostals are here. But I refuse to live in fear. I've decided to move from fear to faith. I'm going to have revival. Somebody needs to come here right now. God is speaking to you. You can start a church. You can have a revival. You can have a breakthrough. You can have a decisive victory. You can see a miracle. You can win a Muslim. You can win a Buddhist. You can win a soul. It's time to move from fear to faith all across this building. If you feel it and you want to come, or if you want to stand where you are, or you want to turn to someone and pray, I challenge you to hear from God. I challenge you to believe for a decisive victory. I challenge you tonight, have faith in God. I challenge you, move from fear to faith. Maybe you should walk down the aisle to show I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm not changing my identity. I'm not changing the gospel. I'm not changing holiness. I'm not changing my church identity. But I am going to move from fear to faith. I am going to move from fear to faith. I am going to move from fear to faith.